Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. We have an audience from around the world, and we're really delighted to welcome you to this session of the World Economic Forum Sustainable Development Impact Summit, focused on the wildfires uh, in the United States and its impact on reforestation efforts. My name is Justin Adams. Uh, I'm the co-director of Nature-Based Solutions here at the World Economic Forum. Uh, and I was uh, involved in the launch of our OneT.org initiative back in uh, January in Davos earlier this year. Uh, and that was a, an effort really to inspire a global movement uh, to bring businesses together, governments, communities and individuals around how we could conserve, restore and grow a trillion trees. Um, at the same time as we launched that effort, if you think back to January, we had the record fires burning uh, in Australia, a total, a staggering total of 45 million acres eventually burned in Australia this year. And it's become increasingly clear that as we've launched this effort around a trillion trees, that we are also in an era of mega fires. Uh, and right now we have had and continue to see the devastating impacts both environmental and human of the, way, of the fires burning across the, uh, the Western United States. Uh, and it's really been sad to see the, you know, those impacts and the predictions of continued mega fires, not just in the United States, Australia, but really all around the world, record fires in the Arctic this year as well. So we're gonna focus on this issue of fire and restoration. The first half of the session is a panel discussion. We've got a fabulous panel here. Uh, we'll be looking at the impacts and the effects of these fires, as well as looking at some of the solutions and some of the reasons that we still have for hope. Uh, the second half, we're going to open up for questions. Uh, if you look now at the slide, there is a, a you can scan that QR code that will take you to Slido or go to slido.com and enter the hashtag SDIS. And there you can post questions that will be screened for the panel so that we can answer those questions. For those of you joined through TopLink, you can also use the chat function uh, on Zoom. Uh, but without further ado, I want to introduce to you this fabulous panel, uh, this fabulous set of panelists that we have. Uh, so firstly, uh, I'm delighted to, have, to welcome Jad Daly, the president and CEO of American Forest, uh, the US uh, the based uh, nonprofit founded in 1875 uh, and a partner for the World Economic Forum in launching the US chapter of 1T.org uh, just in a, a, a month or so ago. Uh, then we have Hillary France, the commissioner of public lands in Washington state, uh, where she manages nearly 6 million acres of public lands covering the coastal waters through the working forests and into agricultural and recreational lands. And then lastly, we have Jennifer Morris, the CEO of the Nature Conservancy, the largest uh, conservation organization in the United States and working in more than 70 countries worldwide and with more than a million members. We've got a great panel. It's gonna be a great discussion. So let's start this discussion off. So firstly, a question to you, Hillary, as someone who's living uh, in a state been so severely impacted by fires uh, and working to manage these burns. Could you give us some understanding of what it's been like uh, to live with them this summer and how you're looking to contain them? Thanks for having me here. It's been one of the most destructive, horrific uh, set of weeks in Washington state's history, frankly. To date in Washington alone, we've nearly had a million acres burn, uh, a total of 1,460 fires. In literally 72 hours, uh, we had over 600,000 acres burn uh, in 72 hours. That's five times the amount of acres that burned all of last year in 2019, more than half in what was our worst wildfire season of 2015 in 72 hours. And that completely destroyed and demolished one entire town, the town of Malden, where it looked like literally a bomb had gone off in just an hour or two. That complete town was decimated and tragically lost lives. Um, here in Washington State, as we know, across the, the coast. The reality is we continue to see ever-increasing wildfires year after year. We're not only seeing more fires, we're seeing a larger spread of the geographical area of our state on fire, as well as our West Coast states. And we're also seeing a longer period. Our, our fire season used to be about two months of the year, just 15 years ago, and it is now nine months of the year. Um, and I know that California experiences at 365. And the reality is we're spending enormous amount of money in responding to these fires. Um, the average cost of the federal government to suppress these fires is $1.8 billion a year. Uh, for us, our state spends on average $153 million a year. We have a fire alone that's cost over $80 million, one fire. 
Um, and the reality is we're going to continue to be paying for it. The question is whether we're going to pay to react in the face of smoke and flames, or we're going to be proactive and make our forests and our communities more resilient to these fires and invest in the wild firefighting resources that we need to get on those fires quickly. So this conversation is perfectly timed. I'm great to be here. Thank you, Hilary, and uh, just a, a sense of just the impacts uh, at so many levels in the state. Uh, so, Jad, a, a question to you. Could you give us some understanding of how we've arrived here uh, in the United States at this time with these mega fires now burning? Yeah, thanks so much, Justin. Actually, but before I, I jump in, I just want to say thank you to uh, Hillary and, and her team and all the folks who are on the front lines keeping us safe from these events. I think, you know, a lot of times these folks work... Uh, out of, out of the public eye and uh, they do incredibly dangerous and difficult work. And I think we just all uh, really owe a debt of gratitude to these public servants that are, are dealing with this wildfire crisis that we have. Um, I, there are multiple causes at work here, but I wanna laser in on three that I think are the key drivers um, that we need to address. And the first is climate change. Uh, and make no mistake, climate change is driving this dramatic increase uh, in wildfires and future wildfire risk. Uh, that, uh, that Commissioner Franz uh, just described, an, an authoritative study uh, published by National Academy of Sciences back in 2016 uh, that found a doubling of the extent of wildfire uh, since uh, the mid-1980s uh, directly tied uh, to climate change. Um, so we can't solve our wildfire crisis without addressing climate change. Uh, but that's a longer term solution because there's already a lot of climate change in motion and we need to deal with it here and now. And that ties to the other part of the equation, which is, is forestry. Um, we need more active forestry and more active utilization of wood products to get our forests back into balance with climate change. Uh, there simply isn't as much water available, uh, hotter and drier conditions. And so we need to fundamentally adjust the structure and composition of our forests to bring them back in balance with climate change. And so that gets to my third point, which is it can't just be more of the same forestry. We need a new kind of forestry. Instead of thinking about restoring our forests uh, to what they were, we need to think about pre-storing our forests for a changing climate and using science as a crystal ball to help us understand what those conditions will be and what kind of structure and composition of forests we need to have in order for those forests to survive and thrive uh, in a changing climate. Thank you, Jad. So uh, this isn't a dichotomy between climate change and management of forests. This is both and. Uh, and a great concept of pre-storing, not just restoring forests. So Jen, uh, across to you, your, your teams work in every state, uh, 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 impacted every state across the United States and you work around the world. What, what, does, what are you seeing and what, uh, what does this mean? Yeah, thanks so much, Justin. I'd like to just reiterate my deep condolences and appreciation for all the communities and the firefighters that are out there on the front lines dealing with this tragedy right now. Um, the reality is that every year, um, if you take the California fires from 2017, it was the worst year. Now we're in the worst year in 2020, and it's just continuing and, and for the reasons that, that Jad said. Um, so, so the Nature Conservancy, as you said, is in every single state. We are working on the front lines with the wonderful people like Hillary's teams on the ground in Washington State, um, as well as really partnering deeply with local communities, indigenous people, to try to address first the crisis but then ultimately, how do we prevent this from happening again? You know, this is a similar situation we're dealing with COVID where we're so focused on the cure right now, which we have to do, but ultimately, how do we prevent this from happening again? And so one of the great things that, that Jad and, and the Nature Conservancy have been working on is how do we fund prevention as opposed to always dealing with the next worst year? And so making sure that our firefighters, our forest teams, our public lands have the resources and the training that they need to actually address bringing value to those forests, to making sure that communities are siting their properties and their lands in a way that is conducive to the new normal, which is a, a world with more and more fire. So we're actively involved in helping to fund that prevention, which is gonna be so, so critical to addressing the next years of fire risk that we're going to see going forward. That's great. So again, a focus on the prevention rather than just having to, to fight the fires as, as we, we have them. So uh, Hillary, if we turn back to you, uh, what, what's the future of, of you know, the beautiful state of Washington and your forest? What's the future for the forest and where are the both the challenges, but also the opportunities you see and the solutions you see moving right. forward? 
called the Evergreen State. We're the Evergreen State for a reason. Uh, and, and my statement is right now we're watching the Evergreen State turn brown and then charcoal black. And it's our responsibility to reverse that trend. Uh, first thing, it is about identifying the problem and where the investments need to go so we can reverse the course we're on and actually change the trajectory of these catastrophic fires. I focus on three things in that, and, and our panels are all echoing the same thing. But first is actually wildfire protection resources. We, throughout this country and in our state, have underinvested in actually the resources to fight these fires. It starts with air resources and initial attack. I have now 11 helicopters that all fought in the Vietnam War, every single one of them. And that's my air arsenal, um, getting all these fires quickly and keeping them small. Um, at the federal level, we borrow a number of resources from other states and federal governments. But when we have the Californias, Oregon's, Colorado's, Montana's, Wyoming's all on fire at the same time, we don't have any more resources to be able to borrow. And so I currently have skeleton crews that have been fighting these fires heroically. And I say every one of our states has to get more dependent on ourselves to fighting those fires. And in a way, when we do that, we can actually also increase economic opportunity as we're looking at some of the most significant economic crisis in, in, given COVID. The second prong or leg of the stool is forest health. We've developed a plan for Eastern Washington that has us, we have about 2.7 million acres of forest alone that are already dead and dying. They're literally a tender box. All it takes is one spark. And we have hundreds of thousands of acres burning like that in 72 hours. Um, we developed a plan that has us restoring the health of those forests over the next 20 years, about 70,000 acres a year. We are being agnostic to property lines because fire and disease um, doesn't follow geographical boundaries. So we partnered with the federal government, so we are doing the work on federal land so we can get there quicker and get it done faster, as well as partnering with American Forests and Nature Conservancy for small forest land. We're now finishing the West Side plan, and it, obviously this takes resources, but it also means economic opportunity, putting people back into the woods to restore the health of the forest, and it's cheaper than fighting those fires. The third one, and I just have to say, is community resilience. After visiting the town of Malden, which is the town that was completely destroyed um, in the last two weeks due to the fire, it was very apparent that we do have the ability to make these communities more resilient to fire. Literally, as you look down the street and you saw every single home completely destroyed, you saw one or two homes sitting amongst that destruction completely intact. Not an ember had touched that home, right? And many of the homes were uninsured. They're completely unprotected. And you have standing chimneys and foundation, but then you have untouched home amongst all that rubble. And it's because they took the steps to make those homes more resilient to fire. They removed, um, all, they kept their lawns water. And so we have to take a three-prong effort, invest in wildfire protection resources, invest in restoring the health of our forests, thousands of acres of production immediately, and we have to do community resilience. Thank you, Hillary. Really powerful uh, call to action. So, Jad, uh, we launched the U.S. chapter of 1T.org to think yeah. about uh, conserving, restoring America's forests. What, what does all this mean? How do people find hope in, uh, in, in the midst of all this destruction? Yeah, thanks, Justin. It's been an amazing partnership with World Economic Forum and, and all of the organizations that have come together for uh, 1T.org globally and here in the U.S. through the new U.S. chapter of 1T.org um, to advance this goal of a trillion trees. Uh, and, and, and look, I, you know, I want to actually shift, shift to thinking about what happens after fire, um, because how do we keep the evergreen state evergreen in terms of uh, repairing some of these damaged landscapes? We have now millions of acres of land across the West that are going to need reforestation. And, and what we've been doing isn't close to keeping up now, let alone keeping up with this increased need that we now have um, to uh, reforest a uh, fire damaged landscape. So that only way we're going to get that right is an all hands on deck collaboration. It's government agencies like the great folks in Washington state. It's NGOs like the Nature Conservancy and American Forests. It's uh, companies that uh, like Salesforce and others that are stepping up to provide resources to help fund uh, these uh, reforestation projects and it's civil society organizations from uh, Girl Scouts uh, and other youth groups to, uh, to, to churches and, and, and other kinds of civil society organizations that want in on this work as well, who see this work of reforestation as, as a great way to care for our environment. And so 
Uh, I think 1T.org gives us a mechanism now, a tent big enough for all those folks to come in and understand this work and then, and then do it uh, together. And I think really importantly, tying back to my earlier point, not just uh, sticking trees in the ground, but understanding that if we're actually gonna be pre-storing our forests for a changing climate, the work of reforestation needs to kick to a whole different order of magnitude in terms of the precision, the species selection and genetics that we're using and, and identifying what trees to plant, the techniques that we're using uh, to, to reforest for resilience, and then ultimately the adaptive management structures that we put in place so we can adjust those for us for the unexpected changes uh, that climate is gonna throw, us, throw at us in the future. And I'll just capstone it by saying, you know, the federal government and, 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 and policymakers uh, across the country have a big role uh, to play here as well. And, you know, just for example, there's bipartisan legislation right now in Congress, uh, the Replant Act, that would provide almost a billion dollars per decade um, to reforest uh, some of these uh, damaged landscapes, in this case, particularly on our national forests, um, and uh, plant uh, 1.2 billion trees and generate almost 49,000 jobs. Um, that's, I call that building back better. Um, so those are the kinds of ways in which everyone can do their part, but that also includes uh, the role of public policy in resourcing this work. Thank, thank you, Jed. So Jen, uh, uh, last question for the panel to you. Yeah, I mean, where does all of this fit globally and what are some of the next steps the Nature Conservancy is seeing? Yeah, uh, so um, this is sort of a microcosm of what's happening around the world in places like Australia and Brazil. If we all remember back to before COVID hit, we were all focused on the Australian wildfires. Um, which just absolutely devastated uh, parts of that country. I mean, an area the size of the entire state of Washington burned in one fire season. And now Australia is starting its next fire season as it, as it rolls into summer there. Um, so it's absolutely devastating everywhere, you know, but of course there is hope. Of course there's on the ground action that the Nature Conservancy, many, many, many partners, both government and nonprofit and corporates, are taking in places like Australia and Brazil, really digging in with indigenous communities, really, again, focusing on how do we make sure that forests are able to realize their total benefits through reforestation? How do we get farmers and forest owners from the US to Brazil and Australia to actually receive income for protecting their forests, for the carbon that it provides, for the water storage services that forests all over the world provide. So this is an all-in effort. Um, I really love to see the efforts of OneTree.org and all of the partners there. I think it's a fantastic initiative to make sure that we're all in on replanting and reforesting and doing it in a science-based way. I think, Jad, what you just mentioned is really critical, that we're ensuring that looking at fire ecosystems, that we're replanting better in, so that we can ensure more fire resilience going forward as climate change accelerates the pace of transition of our entire planet. So love to see this effort and we need to scale it up and um, we're looking forward to participating. Thank you, Jen. So we've got some great uh, questions from the audience uh, that, uh, that I'm gonna move to. And, and one of them is around indigenous people and a few of you have mentioned, uh, a few of you have mentioned indigenous people, one of my uh, some of my best experiences have actually been out uh, in the field with indigenous peoples doing early season burning. I wonder if one of you could uh, say a little bit about how indigenous peoples uh, manage land and uh, and if there's anything that that, that 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 can teach us in terms of where we are. Well, Justin, I'll yeah, maybe just jump uh, in? say a, 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 a quick comment there to kick us off. I'm sure everyone might have different thoughts about this, but uh, but here in the United States, um, uh, you know, the, the forests that uh, the first European settlers found here in the United States were, were heavily managed. Um, and I think that's not always been well understood and including managed uh, with fire. And so there's actually intensive work going on in uh, uh, states across the West to, to learn from uh, a traditional environmental knowledge and to uh, understand some of those patterns. In some cases, uh, the way to pre-store forests, uh, you know, for a new, uh, a new future is actually by looking back to the past and the way that we've managed uh, a forest in, in some cases in very, very different past and in very different structures and composition than what we've become accustomed to in recent decades uh, of, of forestry. So yeah, I think that plays a critical role and, and you know, our organization uh, definitely uh, is engaging with, with tribal partners here in the U.S. and, and you know, trying to bring those practices into our thinking and our advocacy. 
Yeah, yeah. I might jump in with um, with an international example. So, I mean, in Australia, for example, indigenous people have rights to over 70% of the land in Northern Australia. They know how to manage the land. Um, we need to learn from them. So we're working directly with the Australian government as well as these indigenous organizations to really help them have the resources to ensure that they can return the land management back to the indigenous people and use those traditional practices in a, in a more robust way. Um, and that includes burning. That includes burning in cooler months um, as opposed to so to prevent fires in the hot and dry months. So it's a whole regime that indigenous people have done for, for millennia that, that we need to learn from. Yeah, there's a great, go ahead, Hillary. Well, I just add, I'm gonna, so, uh... We are a big supporter of the burning and prescribed fire and doing it at the right time of the year, not when it's hot and dry and everything is on fire. I will be frank that our biggest challenge and struggle is there is too many layers of government review and bureaucracy because there was this tamping down of prescribed fire, of using fire for the health of the forest because they were working on equality. The problem is it's made it really, really difficult to do that at the state and the federal level um, and we end up with the worst air quality in the world, like we have this year and again in 2018, because we're not able to do it when the off season. We've got to break through the state and federal. We've got to be more efficient and speed up that because we're, we become our worst enemy, frankly, in getting the right tools on the ground in the health of these sports. That's great. So that's a nice segue to, a, to, a, to the next question, which is, yeah, you know, in a world where we're seeing so much polarization in politics, uh, not just in the United States, but, but uh, in many countries, is there a political consensus around what needs to be done, around what we need to do with forests and fires? Uh, and is there a way that we can really move some of the political and the policy uh, action forward faster? So Hillary, I might come straight back to you. <laughs> I'm going to jump in here, um, especially, I, you know, my statement is because we've seen these horrific, tragic fires. And I'll say I've got men and women, some of them the age of my son, who are putting their lives on my line every single day. And when they are fighting fires, politics is not in their mind. They know exactly why they're seeing more catastrophic, catastrophic fires. we got hotter, drier temperatures. we got way more fuel on that forest. And they know what the solution is, so they don't have to keep coming back year after year to do it. The problem is we're now politicized a true crisis and a life-threatening crisis. Um, and as I say, hot air has never, ever put out a fire. It frankly just <laughs> infuriates it and makes it larger. And what we need now is less of that hot air, less of the finger pointing and getting people to say, there are two things we got to absolutely do, or three things. One is we got to realize, yes, climate is having a significant impact on our landscapes and on the health of these forests. But we are not having to just assume that is our reality. We got to get in and start managing these forests that recognizes a change in climate and recognizes how we got to this place over the last 50 years through fire suppression and lack of management. And we have to give our communities a fighting chance by saying we are going to make every community that is in these bio, sort of volatile fire zones more safe so they have a fighting chance against those fires and people need to stop talking and actually get to work like our firefighters do. Justin, can I just put Please. two quick things? No, number one, the, the number of pieces of bipartisan legislation that we have in Congress right now to take action on, on these issues is too long for me to mention. Um, I mentioned the Replant Act, but actually there are a number of other bipartisan, bicameral bills uh, that are ready to move. And I, so I do think that uh, when, it, when it comes to these issues, we are one nation under trees and we're seeing that politically. But, uh, but you have to also imagine how influential it is for these lawmakers to see through an effort like the US chapter of 1T.org, private sector organizations uh, and, and non-federal governmental agencies come together to pledge 855 million trees over the next decade and billions of dollars of supporting actions, which is what we announced at launch on August 27th. And that's kind of saying to our uh, elected officials at, you know, at the federal level, hey, where's your part? Um, we, we need a partnership here to scale these actions um, you know, to, to meet the challenge that we're facing. And so I think we do have this convergence, um, just as Hillary said, of, of a bipartisan consensus uh, that we need to get something done here and everyone needs to do more and they need to do it better. Jen, anything you want to add to that? 
Um, I mean, just completely 100% agree. We've got to focus on this, um, again, as a preventative effort going forward because we're just going to see this over and over again. So if we have, you know, factions fighting against each other, we need to listen to our ecologists and not our politicians on this. Um, and the ecologists know how to manage these forests and how to bring value to the forest. So increasingly, we've got to just do that as opposed to, um, to as Hillary greatly said, listening to the hot air because it's not going to solve anything. Yeah. So uh, there's, a, there's a great sort of article yesterday in Yale E360 that talks about this is not a new normal. Right? And so we're not in a new normal. This is actually a, a completely different paradigm that we're now living in. And, and yet we still treat it as an environment issue. You've talked about jobs and the job opportunities there. You've talked about communities and the resilience of communities. How, yeah, and, and you've talked about this is a bipartisan issue that politicians from both aisles can actually align around. So how can we actually mobilize more action and the urgency that's required to break down some of the bureaucratic barriers you touched on, Hillary? What more is it gonna take? So I, I gotta say that progress has been made. I mean, since I started in this work, and I know Jad knows this and Jad, but so progress is being made. And I think we are seeing more of that bipartisanship in this. Um, I think the first thing is, I mean, it's raining outside my window and literally five days ago, I couldn't even go outside because the smoke was so thick. We've got to make sure that our leaders at all levels are not forgetting the tragedy of this fire season. Because too often what happens is by the time they're in session at the state or federal level, it's raining, it's cold, they forgot. Um, and we have the requirement, we have the moral responsibility not to forget that this is an ongoing annual issue across the country, across this world, we have to stay focused and we can't solve it in one year. Um, we also have, I think the key piece is being able to make that economic side of this, this right. Right now, majority of the fight is it's an environment issue. No, it's a forest management economic issue. Really, it is an environmental, economic, and social crisis. And we have to see them as all together. But that means the solutions are also going to, the environmental solutions will be economic solutions, will be social solutions. And I think if we can start to show that case that here's how much you're already spending of 1.8 billion, this isn't a choice between the housing and transportation and the other critical needs. It is an investment in jobs, it's an investment in communities and it's an investment in the environment and it will have far more returns in our quality of life but also in our job and economic opportunity. And we've got to tell that story better and we got to say it with metrics and numbers. Yeah, yeah, so just one minute, Jed, and then quick last word to Jen. Yeah, you bet. 39.7 jobs per million dollars invested. That's what the numbers tell us. And, and uh, we need to tell that story. Uh, follow uh, Hillary Franz and Jennifer Morris on Twitter. Maybe me too, if you're into it. We all have to tell this story together. We need an echo chamber. Thanks, Jed. Jen. Yeah, I mean, my takeaway here is, again, for every dollar we invest in prevention, we're going to save six dollars, just pure economics on dealing with the crises that are ahead of us. So invest now. Everyone who's listening out there, please talk to your political leaders. Make sure they understand the importance of managing forests sustainably. Make sure they understand that this is going to continue and we've got to invest now. We've got to build back better. Thank you so much. Uh, so, I mean, so much we can take from this panel, but uh, I loved how you phrased it earlier, Hillary. We have to invest in fighting the fires. We have to invest in forest health. We have to invest in community resilience. And I think I would add a fourth, which is we have to invest in changing the narrative and bringing people together around this critical issue. Uh, and I think uh, you've done a fabulous job, all of you, of highlighting this, of highlighting both the impacts that we're seeing today, but as well, we know what can be done. We know what the solutions are. Uh, and so as we close, I would invite everybody to just spare a thought, to give some prayers to all those who are on the front line, uh, and that we cannot forget the moral responsibility that Hillary has just reminded of us, that as the news cycle passes, that these fires, these communities are still here. So we have to be working together to how do we do that. I wanna thank the panelists for a really fabulous high energy discussion. I wanna thank all of you for listening. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions, but please tune back in to more from the Sustainable Development Impact Summit and the final day tomorrow. And please stay safe uh, and thank you all. <laughs>